We begin with Canada's latest contribution of military aid to Ukraine. Canada's total tank contribution now stands at eight. Anita Anand is Minister of National Defence. She joins us now live from Mississauga, Ontario. Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, less than a month ago, it was four tanks that Canada was able to send to Ukraine. Now it's up to eight tanks. Uh, what changed that you were able to double that commitment? We took a, another look at the inventory in terms of tanks in the Canadian Armed Forces and made sure that we had the spare parts as well as with our allies, making sure that we were coordinated with them and were able to make another donation of four tanks, a recovery vehicle, which is like a tow truck for tanks, uh, 5,000 rounds of 155 millimeter ammunition, as well as training. So this is a full package that we are putting on the table for Ukraine. And as I said, Canada has been one of the foremost countries in terms of military aid, but also in terms of getting the aid over where it needs to go. So, so you say you had to work with your other allies on this. Does this mean, does Britain have some parts we can use? Was it that sort of thing? Were you going into each other's inventories and swapping things off to make tanks battle ready with spare parts? Was it that kind of effort? Well, needed to make sure that there was a certain volume of spare parts because, as you know, this is very complex equipment, the Leopard 2A4 battle tank. Uh, a mechanic forms part of the crew, in fact, in the battle tank, and we needed to make sure that there was a steady supply chain of spare parts. Of course, I'm still working on the issue of spare parts and supply chain. I have raised with my allies the question of intellectual property and the possibility of releasing such intellectual property so that there can be the production of spare parts here at home as well. Uh, because, of course, Canadian industry is also very important in the equation of recapitalizing the Canadian Armed Forces. Right, okay, to expand the product lines, essentially, to be able to outfit these tanks and keep them going. So it, it, was a, it sounds like it was a stretch to get to eight because of these challenges. Does that mean eight is the cap, or is there a path where you could send more in coming months? Well, as I said, when I announced the first four Leopard 2A4 battle tanks, we will always look at what options are on the table from a CAF inventory standpoint, but as well as from a procurement standpoint. And so that's why we are considered to be in the top five of countries who have put military aid on the table. And indeed, NATO Secretary General told me today that it is good to know that we can trust Canada that's because we have been continuing to put aid on the table now over $1 billion, and today eight 2A4 Leopard tanks will be in Ukraine on the battlefield for defending the sovereignty and security of that great nation. So giving the tanks to Ukraine uh, means obviously taking them from the Canadian Armed Forces, so there's a capacity deficit there now for the forces here at home. Uh, how, what's your plan for procuring replacement tanks? Is that something that can even happen quickly given the global strain on military equipment that's happening right now? Well, you're correct to point to the fact that demand for military equipment, for ammunition, for heavy artillery, for tanks is at a premium, and therefore the pressure is on the supply chain. And what I have been doing, because a priority of mine is to recapitalize the Canadian Armed Forces equipment, is to speak with suppliers, is to assert Canada's priority in the supply chain. I've been doing that internationally and domestically. And we are also undertaking a defense policy update to examine across the board what additional capabilities the Canadian Armed Forces need, what innovation we as a government need to bring to the table to capitalize the Canadian Armed Forces with new equipment, and how we can, of course, work with our supply chain partners to ensure that the Canadian Armed Forces have the equipment that they need to protect and defend our great country. I wonder if I could just broaden this out a little bit. I wanted to ask you about China, because we, we started this week with Secretary of State Antony Blinken warning China, and, and Jens Stoltenberg with NATO has done the same, not to give military aid to Russia, seemingly based on U.S. intelligence that that was possible. We saw the meeting in Moscow between China's top diplomat and Vladimir Putin this week, and today uh, the Chinese come out with 
a peace plan, as they call it, though it's been met with some skepticism. Given all of this conflicting activity throughout the week, do you think China can play a, a meaningful role in trying to broker a peace here, given its relationship with Russia? Well, what I'd like to say, David, is peace in Ukraine will come when Vladimir Putin leaves the country that he illegally and unjustifiably invaded. Peace will come, and the process of peace will come as determined by President Zelensky. That's the supporting role that Canada will play until then, will be to supply Ukraine with the military equipment that it needs to fight and win this war. Nobody knows what Russia or China are going to do next, but we do know that we can prioritize Ukraine's defense of its democracy and our support of democracy writ large, which it is also fighting for. What concerns do you have, though, if, if Secretary of State Blinken's concerns were to be true? Uh, China certainly has the military and economic and industrial capacity to, to tip things in a meaningful way on the battlefield. I mean, what concerns do you have that, given it's already become challenging to meet the ammunition and equipment needs uh, that President Zelensky has? I think on a military level, David, it's fairly clear that we are eyes wide open on China. We have interdicted and retrieved uh, boys that they placed in our waters. We have shot down suspected objects together with NORAD and in conjunction with our American uh, allies. We are eyes wide open on China. We will cooperate where we must, and we will challenge China where we ought to, and that's exactly what we're doing. I spoke with Petro Poroshenko yesterday, the, the former president of Ukraine, and he's calling for Canada to support Ukraine's push for full membership in NATO. I know this has been an issue on the table for quite some time, and NATO's wanted to see some reforms within Ukraine, and certainly with Article 5, them joining at this current moment would be a difficult thing to do. But in the aftermath of this conflict and in the medium to long term, is this something Canada is prepared to get behind and, and fully support? My focus right now, David, is to do whatever I can to get military aid on the table and out the door for Ukraine. And that's exactly what we have done over the past year by putting $1 billion of military aid on the table by ensuring that we are transporting 7 million pounds of military aid on behalf of our allies, by training over 35,000 members of the Ukrainian armed forces. That is the issue that I will continue to focus on. What does Ukraine need in terms of military aid, and how can I be helpful and determined as the Minister of National Defense? Well, just a, a final point on that. Uh, President Zelensky has made it clear they need fighter jets, and they're asking the allies for fighter jets. I, I don't know, given the state of our fleet, if Canada is able to respond to that request. I wonder what your sense is of that. And, and given the reluctance and the, 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 the reasonable concerns about training time to get people into the cockpits of F-16s or whatever, uh, do you think NATO and the allies and the people you meet with at the Ramstein Group can, will and can meet this request? At the Ramstein Group, what we usually do is go country by country to put on the table what capabilities each country has and which capabilities we can effectively and efficiently get out the door. And that's why Canada is able to put forward eight Leopard 2A4 battle tanks, for example. It is always a question of what capabilities a country has and what capabilities that country can easily part with. And I will say, it's not just a matter of the capability itself. It's also a question of sustainment and training. So every time Canada puts military aid on the table, we are also focused on this question of the longevity of the capability. How can we sustain it? So for example, those 39 armored vehicles that we procured from GDLS in London, we made sure there were maintenance and training components to the armored vehicles that we were sending over to Ukraine because we realize that we have to be there for Ukraine in the short and the long term with the military aid that we provide. We have to be able to offer support in terms of sustainment. So whether we're talking about fighter jets or tanks or cameras for drones or armored vehicles, 
those are the central questions on the table. Mm -hmm. Do we have the capability and can we ensure sustainment and training in the long term if we do provide that capability? Is that the concern with the fighter jets, Minister, that you could make the commitment, but you couldn't sustain it and it wouldn't be there for the long term? And I wonder how would you balance something like that with maybe the jolt it can give Ukraine in the battlefield to more swiftly end the conflict? Well, as you may know, uh, David, we have brought our planes home from Romania so that they can be uh, recalibrated and so that we can ensure that training occurs and we are ready for the receiving of the F-35s, 88 of them, which we recently announced were finalized in terms of the contract with Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. And so we are in a transition period in terms of our a RCAF capabilities. Um, but of course, at all times, we will continue to look at what aid Ukraine needs to fight and win this war on the one hand, and what capabilities Canada has on the other. And that's the process that we engage in every single time we think about aid from the Canadian Armed Forces inventory. Uh, just a, a final question before I let you go. It, it seems to me, though, that the, it, it seems unlikely at this point that President Zelensky's call for fighter jets will be met. Is that a fair assessment, at least in the short term, uh, of where to look at things? It's still an ongoing conversation uh, between countries around the NATO table, between countries uh, at the Defence Contact Group. And as I said, Canada will always be there for Ukraine to provide military equipment and supplies. That's why we are ranked in the top five by an independent panel of countries that is able to get aid out the door and into Ukrainian hands on the battlefield. Okay, Minister Anna, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much. Take care. That's Minister of National Defence, Anita Anand. China claims it now wants to act as a mediator between Russia and Ukraine. Today, it published a so-called 12-point peace plan. That plan calls for an immediate ceasefire, peace talks, and the respect for all sovereignty of all countries. But it also takes aim at the West, urging those nations to abandon a Cold War mentality and end all unilateral sanctions. Beijing claims it is a neutral party to the war, but just this week, China and Russia announced a deepening of its strategic partnership, and the U.S. is warning that China is considering providing Russia with weapons and ammunition. Ian Bremmer is president and founder of the Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. He is in New York. Uh, Ian Bremmer, I'd like to start with what President Xi rolled out today. China calls it a peace plan. What do you call it? Uh, I would say that it is an opportunity for the Chinese to put themselves more front and center on the global stage. Uh, I will tell you that if you didn't know the Chinese had written this plan, could have come from India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, and pretty much any developing country around the world. This is the perspective that a majority of the world's population has on the Russian war in Ukraine. They, they respect Ukraine's territorial integrity, but they want the war over, they want a ceasefire, they want an end to the sanctions, uh, and they don't want nuclear weapons used. They kind of, the Chinese kind of did tick by tick, and they know that Ukraine won't support this, they know the United States won't, and that, that gives the Chinese both an opportunity to play the role of global leader with the global south, as we call it, but also gives the Russians an opportunity to align more with the Chinese in a way that the Chinese and the Russians are both comfortable with. Okay, so, so I want to pick up on that because China is claiming to be a neutral party in this and rolling out what it calls a peace plan, which, as you say, the West probably would not accept. But then right. Beijing and Moscow, they're, they're, they're meeting this week talking about deepening their strategic partnership. So what is China's role here? What's, what's its endgame in this? Well, I mean, China is a strategic partner of Russia. It is an asymmetric relationship. Russia's a lot less powerful. They're not quite allies. And of course, uh, China's been a little embarrassed by the fact that they've been tarred to a degree by their relationship with Russia over the course of the last year. And I think that China's hope is that by taking on this peace plan and getting a bunch of countries aligned with them, that their relationship with Russia becomes less problematic um, even among some European countries. Uh, because I fully expect that Xi Jinping is going to make a trip to Moscow in the coming months. I think that Wang Yi's trip, the top diplomat of China, to Moscow this week uh, was really a precursor planning for that. 
And the Americans are going to be none too pleased about that reality. But the Chinese feel like if the U.S. isn't going to play any role in diplomacy, and if they can show that the Americans are actually escalating from the perspective of the poorer countries, because the West is providing all these weapons, right. the West is engaged in all these sanctions. And if you're a Brazil, you're a South Africa, all you see is that the global economy is worse for you, prices of food and fertilizers worse. You want an end to this. You know, you, you, you don't prioritize Ukraine the way the West does. You think the only reason the West is doing that is because they're a bunch of white Europeans. You're talking about Palestinians or Yemenis uh, or Ethiopians. And, you know, there's a lot of performative support and very little money and no weapons. Right. So the division of those perspectives is pretty clear. But if, as you say, China and, and, and the global south and these other countries want this war to end, if President Xi goes to Moscow, if they do deepen those ties, that doesn't feel like steps that would speed up the resolution of this conclusion that may prolong it. Or am I reading that wrong? That's an interesting question. I mean, to the extent that the war grinds into a stalemate, um, then that probably does mean that you'll see an expanded continuation of the war if the West holds together as a coalition the way they have in the last 12 months. Mm. That's a question mark. I mean, we've seen that Republicans in the United States are increasingly unwilling to provide the same level of support that they were six months, a year ago. You saw Trump, former President Trump, going to Ohio saying, why is Biden in Kiev? I'm here taking care of Americans. I mean, obviously, that's performative, too. But in an American electoral cycle, that's an open question. And the willingness of NATO to continue to provide the same level of support, I, I think, is, is starting to diminish. I also have spoken to a lot of Ukrainian leaders in the last week, and, and they don't want the Americans to say, we're with you for as long as it takes. They want as much support as possible right now, because they don't think they can survive a three, a five, a 10 year war. They don't think the time is on their side, frankly. So uh, on that point, I mean, we've seen the unanswered calls from President Zelensky and others for, for fighter jets and the concerns there from the allies on doing that. But we've also seen the warnings from uh, Secretary of State Blinken, from uh, Secretary G General Stoltenberg, warning China against supplying military aid to Russia. Given what you've laid out, do you think China would seriously consider giving lethal military aid to Vladimir Putin? So uh, you mentioned two points there. I want to address both of them. First of all, the fighter jets, the F-16s, irrelevant. They shouldn't be making headlines. It would take six months to get them to Ukraine. Won't really change the war. Need to be trained on them. No, what really matters is getting the Ukrainians ammunition. They need ammunition for air defense so the Russians can continue to not use their jet fighters against Ukrainian civilian centers. And they need uh, you know, 155 millimeter ammunition to allow them to do a counteroffensive come this spring. They don't have what they need. That needs to be stepped up. It's not sexy like F-16s mm. or like Bradley tanks, but it's what they need. Now, the Chinese, I would be very surprised if the Chinese go ahead and provide direct military support to Russia. That is one thing that would strongly unite many Europeans with the Americans in opposing China, even putting sanctions against China in a way that they've been very reluctant to do so. It put Canada in a very difficult position, for example. And, and I don't think that the Chinese are planning that. Now, it is quite plausible that the Chinese have had some conversations with the Russians and they thought they could get away with sending them some stuff and the Americans wouldn't find out about it. Well, this is what Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, as well as Rishi Sunak, the UK Prime Minister, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, they were coordinated last week in putting the Chinese on notice. We know what you're up to. Don't you dare. This is a red line. I personally would be very surprised if the Chinese persisted and actually went ahead and sent lethal support to the Russians in this war. They'll just keep buying the oil and doing things like that, supporting it economically. You think that's how just this like continues? India. Yeah. Just like India, there's no difference between China's position on Russia and India's position over the last year, even though India is a part of the Quad and the Americans, of course, support them on national security. That's what's so interesting about this. That's why this peace plan from China was probably a strategically smart move for Xi Jinping to make. OK, Ian Bremmer, we always appreciate your time and your insights. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure, guys.
Canada is boosting its support for Ukraine. The tanks and ammunition is the latest donation in what amounts to $5 billion in contributions from Canada. How is that support being received in Ukraine? Larissa Galadza is Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. She's in Kyiv. Uh, ambassador, you're in Kyiv now, uh, but this invasion forced you and the embassy to relocate temporarily to Poland. Uh, but now you're back in the Ukrainian capital. What are your thoughts when you're in to be back in, in the capital city of the country? To come back last May with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister Freeland was euphoric. It was, for me personally, it was uh, it was um, the highlight of, of my career. Um, it was really important. Uh, and, and, and since uh, coming back in May, we've done nothing but uh, engage Ukrainians at all levels and even in different parts of the country uh, to to understand as best we can what's going on here on the ground and how Canada can help. What's happening on the ground there today, right? Because we're marking this as an anniversary, though it feels a bit weird to mark this kind of an anniversary, but it is a one-year milestone, a stock-taking day for a lot of us journalistically. What's the mood and the vibe there in Kyiv on a day like this? The mood was definitely somber and uh, and quiet. Uh, the city was quiet, uh, and yeah, it's 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 been it's being marked. I think that's the right way to say it. But as in the lead up to to today, as I spoke to Ukrainians about what they would what they would be doing, in part searching for what I might do, mm. um, they um, they said we can't. There's no time for reflection. Someone said, I want to delete uh, the last year. Another woman said to me, and this was heartbreaking, she said, there are no days, there are no anniversaries, there are no holidays. There's just time between now and victory. And we just have to pass through that time. So uh, so for, for Ukrainians, they don't have the luxury to sit back and think. Um, they are very much focused on, on moving ahead. Right, the job isn't done, the fight is still happening, so there's, there's no time and energy to spend on commemoration. Exactly. Um, Canada announced today uh, four more Leopard 2 tanks, 5,000 rounds of ammunition, $32 million in additional funding to support things like demining efforts and ways to counter chemical and radiological uh, threats there. Um, is part of your job to convey to Ottawa the needs that Canada can help address? Like, are you speaking with Ukraine to get a list of things that can be added on from Canada? There are many of us Canadians who are involved in the process of making sure that we understand Ukraine's needs and we provide them with what they need. There's no point sending things um, that they're that they're not asking for. Um, so yes, we play we play a role in that uh, absolutely. Uh, we play a role in just maintaining those in maintaining those relationships. Uh, we also play a, a role uh, here at this end, uh, coordinating with our like-minded with the. G7 with NATO allies and and keeping our finger on the political pulse in in this country. Um, so uh, so yes, absolutely, it is a very large team effort. What's your read on the political pulse in Ukraine to what China uh, proposed today? They kind of weighed into this with a uh, a peace plan, as they're calling it. Though some people look at it more skeptically than that. I mean, what's your reaction to what China put on the table, and what's your sense of how it's being received there today in Kiev? I was with a, a, a number of uh, very smart Ukrainians today and, uh, and trying to sort of probe that very question. And uh, they don't have an official position uh, on this. And I think that they're, I think that they're, they, I know that they're extremely skeptical about it. But one, one gentleman made an important point. And he said, there's nothing in there that talks about accountability. And accountability is key to a, a sustainable uh, and just peace. If we, Russia has to pay for this, if they do not feel the pain of paying for, uh, for the destruction, for the crimes, then they'll just be back here. So uh, that was, uh, was one interesting comment uh, that I heard, and I think that in time we may hear more from the Ukrainians. Do you get a sense that Ukraine could see a role for China in this? I, I know their top diplomat was in Moscow meeting with Vladimir Putin, talking about deepening their strategic partnership. Uh, the U.S. has warned them against rumors or intelligence they have about providing weapons to Russia. I mean, would China be trusted as a broker for a potential 
detente with Russia, given the closeness with the regime in Moscow? That is such a complicated question, not to me, but for Ukrainians, that I, I'm not going to I'm not going to speculate at all. But I think that um, I think that you're exactly right. This is something that the Ukrainians uh, uh, will approach with extreme caution. You, you were on this show last March and you told us that seeing the aggression made you think, why does this keep happening? You know, why does this sort of conflict keep happening? That, and you talked about the pointlessness of this fight, but you felt great pride in the response of the Ukrainian people. How do you feel now, a year later, where the Ukrainian people are, that Kyiv is now under their control, it's safe for you to be there, and they've reclaimed uh, more than half of the territory they lost? Well, it's been a, a year of surprises, uh, and, uh, a, and, and, and most of that comes from, from the Ukrainian side, what they've been able to accomplish, uh, what they have uh, been able to mount as a defense, as counter offensives. Um, uh, their, their, their resilience is unbelievable to watch. Um, but the senselessness of it um, still hits hard. Uh, and, and you think this could be stopped if one man just decided that it could, that, that he's stopping it. Um, so, so that remains very, very difficult. And while I'm here in Kyiv and I'm in relative safety and, and, and security, there are many towns and villages and cities in this country that either don't exist anymore or are seeing regular shelling, regular bombardment. They don't have the kinds of air defenses that Kyiv have. They're closer uh, to the Russian border and to to uh, to, the, to the to the to the line, and um, and and life there is absolute hell for the people who remain and for the Ukrainian security and defense forces who just want Russia out of their country. I, I went through that list of increased aid and additional aid, military and otherwise, announced this week. What's the one big thing that Ukraine needs right now? Uh, I, I know beyond the fighter jets, I know there's a demand for fighter jets and a demand for ammunition. But in a humanitarian level and a basic civil society level, what's the missing piece in the aid they're looking for right now? The missing piece that they would say is speed. Mm. on the uh, on the delivery of weapons and there isn't yes you've mentioned the 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 the, uh, the fighter jets but they're using up their ammunition constantly they're using their vehicles uh, so us uh, providing the announcement today of 5000 more rounds of ammunition uh, yet another vehicle more tanks all of that together with all the partners who are supporting Ukraine militarily, it adds up. So it just needs to, it needs to keep coming. Ambassador Gladza, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you.